two. Once you realize you've got a problem, which I did with Zia, you then need to be aware enough to understand that there are two games going on at any given time. This theory of the inside out and the outside in game, I first heard it from uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith when I was at Agape in Los Angeles. And he says, you only play two games, either the inside out game or the outside in game, okay? And this is really important because if you're fighting with your kid all the time, like I was when I was four or five, and you find yourself blaming your child for these issues. So let's just say uh, one big thing of mine, for example, was Zia would never want to go to bed with me. Like when I, she wouldn't want me to take her to bed. She wanted mum to take her to bed. She would like, there would be this whole performance as we were going to bedtime where she would scream and cry. She would tell me she hates me, like the whole gamut. And I would get like completely triggered, completely dysregulated. And I would start like getting my inner child would be activated and I would go to war with her, right? Welcome to the 1000 Days Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am alcohol-free as fuck, living a self-led life. And I spend every waking moment of that life helping other people do the same. Welcome. I feel a little bit rusty. It's been a long time, maybe three or four months. Uh, and it's a big thing for me, guys. Like, uh, I want to lead with an apology, actually, because I think this podcast in one form or another has been running for a decade. I don't think I've ever gone longer than a couple of weeks without putting out a podcast. So this is like the longest that I've gone. Uh, so I think I deserve you. I, you deserve uh, an explanation. So I'll start with that. Um, and I guess two things. One, I've been very busy um, outside of being the CEO, founder of Strive. I work for a company called Triton. It's a uh, high stakes poker tour. And I do TV production, but also creating a documentary, which hopefully you'll see one day on Netflix or Apple TV or one of the big um, networks. And it's really busy. It takes up a lot of time. So there's that. But I think the more <clears throat> important reason I've been away is just um, a little bit of confusion and a lack of surety for the first time in my life about how to move forward, you know? I was watching a video from Elizabeth Gilbert uh, this morning talking about the difference between having a hobby, having a job, having a career, and having a vocation, right? And for me, the vocation, you know, vocation is the holy grail for everybody, right? It's that thing you do because you think it's your calling. And you would do it even if you didn't get paid. And for the past... 14, 15 years, my vocation has been helping people to become alcohol-free as fuck, to overcome alcohol uh, reliance. And more recently, I've been thinking a lot about the best way to do that and the type of people that I want to be working with, right? So let's just talk about the type of people I want to be working with for a moment. Uh, yesterday, I was walking down the street with my daughter, and I had to grab her quickly and move to the side as a drunk uh, homeless guy nearly fell into her, right? Um, I could work with those guys, right? And women. I could go help the homeless and the people who could possibly die if they stopped drinking alcohol. I could do that. I could go work with rehabs and partner with rehabs and work with people who were drinking um, Listerine and... Um, a hand sanitizer, right? I could do that. There are plenty of people in the world who are really struggling with alcohol uh, in a very, very, very nasty way, and I could help them. But I don't want to do that, and I've never wanted to do that. For me, the bigger problem around alcohol reliance is, and the insidious nature of it, is the fact of its reach and how the damage is unseen because it is normalized. So for me, rather than helping somebody who has fallen and stooped so low that they're drinking a bottle of vodka a day, I want to help the parent who is drinking a bottle of wine a day and has four kids and thinks that there's nothing wrong with that, right? And their children are growing up with the same limiting belief that, that alcohol is 
like this panacea of hedonism, right? Like it's the greatest thing in the world, which I once thought myself. So, you know, it's like they're the type of people I want to help. But it's not an easy, it's it's not an easy group of people to help because how can you help somebody who doesn't think they have a problem, right? You know, it's very difficult. So, and also, I'm a really great believer that, and this might sound controversial to some of you, but I'm a great believer that actually stopping drinking alcohol is really easy. Um, what is difficult is staying stopped, right? Like, like being able to stop and then learn to exist in life, not on the path of least resistance, not with the status quo still aligned, but actually to try to change who you are and how you're behaving to go from living an unconscious life, which most of us do 90% of the time anyway, with or without alcohol, to like taking a stand and saying, you know, I want to live more consciously. Like I, I want to be a, I want to understand myself better. And I want that understanding to be released upon the world and the people who spiral into my orbit in a really healthy way. My friends, my mom, my dad, my sisters, my work colleagues, my wife, my children. Like I can touch, influence, inspire, lead all of those people. And my energy can impact them in very different ways, dependent on where my North Star is pointed, right? So for me, it became very apparent very early on, but I've been spending the last four months really thinking about what to do with this, that I don't want to help people quit alcohol. Like I want to help people live more consciously. And if they choose that path, they wouldn't want to drink alcohol, right? So, so I think I can reach and touch and change and make a bigger difference in the world by helping people live more consciously, live, live in a self-led life. So I didn't do a podcast for a long time because I'm like, do I have to change the podcast name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't really think I have to because, you know, when you do go 1,000 days sober, which is like, you know, 2.7 years, I think it is, um, these are the problems that you start to face. These are the, the next level questions that you are getting into. But I want people to get into them a lot earlier. Um, so anyway, so that's why I've not been around. And so moving forward on this podcast, it will be less alcohol focused and more focused on the full plethora of life, business, career, vocation, relationships, sex. I mean, money, um, parenting. We, we've always been a bit like this on here anyway, but just more, more pronounced and less really about alcohol. And today, um, I want to talk about parenting, actually. I have a cup. Little drink of tea. I want to talk about parenting. And I'm going to start by saying um, when I did my Elementum Coaching Institute training to be a master life coach, um, for the six months that I did that training, I had to pick a, a project. <clears throat> and that project could have been business related or family related. And at the time, I chose a project to get closer to my daughter. Um, she's seven now. I can't remember how old she was there, maybe four or five. But that was my project for six months, get closer to my daughter. And I want to share with you the nine core reasons that I succeeded in that project. Because I really want strive to be in the game of being generational lineage breakers. Imagine if we became alcohol-free as fuck and more conscious and our children experienced that next level shit and they then became the same kind of people that we were, what a difference they will be able to make in the world, right? Like I didn't stop drinking until I was 35. I didn't realize that I was living largely unconscious and in my ego until I was in my mid forties, imagine the impact I could have had on the world if I would have got that a little bit sooner or as a child even was able to learn those things. So I think this work is really important. Um, so here are my nine 
um, things. And if you're a parent or you're not a parent, listen to this because it's really important. Don't turn off yet if you're not a parent. Um, your external world mirrors your internal world, and your internal world mirrors your external world. Even if you don't have children outside of you, you have children within you, right? You're not, I don't believe that you are a monomind. I believe that you are a collection of different personalities that make up a uh, perfectly imperfect you. Uh, and most of those parts, your ego, are juvenile parts that were created when you were really young. And part of your role as self is to actually become a better parent to those parts that live internally in your mind, your body, and your soul, right? So even if you're not a parent externally, you're definitely a parent internally. You certainly need to learn to reparent or be a better parent. So don't run away if you're not a parent, right? Because this uh, really, you'll learn a lot out of this as well. <clears throat> so number one, the first thing is you need to be aware that there is a problem to solve. Um, one of the great things about Strive and what I'm trying to encourage, basically at the crux of everything we do is self-awareness, all right? We need to stop biology and the way that human beings are actually created. We're created and designed to for habituation. You know what I mean? Like we jump in a car and we get from A to B and we don't even know how we got there. Uh, we go uh, put our pin number in the cash machine. We haven't even looked at it. We're like, like we're so habituated. Um, we go to the pub and we drink alcohol. We don't even know why we're doing it, right? Like Christmas, we buy a lot of presents. We have no idea why we're doing it. We don't know why we're eating meat versus cauliflower. Like we're, we're so unconscious most of the time. So raising your self-awareness is really, really important. Uh, and, and how you do that is by just being aware in the moment, a moment by moment, a mindfulness, I guess, or, or increasing your mindfulness of what's going on in the moment. But most importantly, because that is a real stretch, most importantly, it's just realizing when you fucked up and putting things right. Okay. So like if you are currently right now, constantly fighting with your children, then I want to thrust that into your awareness that that's not right. I, um, it, it, like we shouldn't be constantly fighting. All right. So the first thing for me was recognizing that I was constantly fighting with a four or five year old. And recognizing that that's not right, okay, that I want to do something about it. So awareness, number one, is the most important thing. So, like, if you are in that spot, like I say, I want you to ask yourself, is this right? Do I want to behave in this way towards my children, right? Like, that is the most important thing. And if you're able to look in the mirror and say, no, I don't want to behave like this anymore, you're on your path, right? And if you do... This ain't the podcast for you, and we're not the people that can help you moving forward, right? Number two, once you realize you've got a problem, which I did with Zia, you then need to be aware enough to understand that there are two games going on at any given time. Uh, this um, theory of the inside-out and the outside-in game, I first heard it from... Uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith, when I was at Agape in Los Angeles, and my mentor, Preston Smiles, follow him on Instagram, top, top guy. Uh, he talked about it a lot uh, when I was in Elementum. And he says, you are only play two games, either the inside-out game or the outside-in game. Okay? And this is really important because if you're fighting with your kid all the time, like I was when I was four or five, and you find yourself blaming your child for these issues, so let's just say, uh, one big thing of mine, for example, was Zia would never want to go to bed with me. Like when I, she wouldn't want me to take her to bed. She'd want a mum to take her to bed. She would like, there would be this whole performance as we were going to bedtime where she would scream and cry. She would tell me she hates me, like the whole gamut. Um, and I would get like completely triggered, completely dysregulated. And I would start like getting my inner child would be activated and I would go to war with her, right? And part of that war was really blaming and judging my daughter and having the expectation that she should behave differently. So what I'm doing is I'm playing the outside in game, right? In that moment, uh, I, my internal system as a, at the time, 40-year-old, 40 40-something-old, 40 um, is, being, is being triggered and dictated by a four, five-year-old girl. Like, I'm basically a victim. 
and I'm making her out to be a villain, right? I'm living an, an outside in life. I'm at the whim of external factors. And you can, you could broaden that, right? Like if you find yourself blaming um, the government for the state of your country, if you blame uh, your local council for the mess around your street, if you blame God because it's never sunny, if you blame your house because it's cold, if you blame your dog because it's shit on the floor, if you blame your mom and your dad for the way that you were raised, if you blame your school teachers and the education system for not educating you properly, if you blame your coach for not being good enough, if you uh, blame your friends for not knocking on the door and asking you to come out, if you blame alcohol for making it unsafe to go to a nightclub, all of these things are outside of you, right? Uh, and you have no control because you're you're literally saying, my nervous system regulation is it the is it the you know I don't have no control over it. The the outside in game is in play, and external forces dictate that. If you're playing the inside out game, what you're saying is actually I'm fully resourced within myself, within my own mind, body, mind, soul. Um, I'm resourced enough to handle this. I'm the person who manages my nervous system. I'm the person who sets boundaries. I I have my belief systems, I have my worldviews, but they're not too stringent. They're very flexible. I kind of know where I'm going with it. Like I I I know where I'm going. I I I I understand self, all that kind of stuff. Like you're playing the inside-out game. And a big part of that is um it's just like this, this question: who who do we need to fix? Do we need to fix the kid or do we need to fix a parent? Very often we take this status hierarchy and we think the kid needs fixing. Like, I need to show this kid. Like I was in Montenegro recently, and I was in a conversation with one of my uh, Triton cameramen telling him that I was going to be putting Zia on a um, on a bike riding course. And he was laughing at me. He was saying, but that's your job as a father to teach her how to ride a bike. And I said, actually, I found it really difficult to teach my children to ride a bike. Uh, and he said, why? And I said, because none of them were wanted to ride one. And he, he was like, well... I wouldn't have that problem. I said, what would you do then? Well, I would just tell them they got to ride their bike. I said, what would you do if they didn't want to leave the house to ride their bike? Well, I would just tell them they have to. Yeah, how would you do that then? Would you shout at them? Would you scream at them? Would you hit them? Would you drag them out of the house? Well, no, I would just be assertive and tell them they have to do it. And and it was really interesting and really funny because in that moment, it's kind of like you're we're slipping in. He he was slipping into the stereotype. It's like, I'm I'm in charge here. Right, I, I am the status hierarchy. I am the parent, and they will do what I tell them to do. And if I think that riding a bike is really important, I will. I will tell them to do that. Um, I don't. I don't have that view. Right, like, like, I don't have. I don't want to get into that territory. Um, I don't think. I think it's it's the way that I want to approach life and living a self led life is when it comes to who needs fixing here is me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's always me. Right. Like, and when I push myself to the limit and somebody in a relationship with me um, is not is not playing ball and not keeping up and not doing their part, um, then they're not in a relationship with me anymore. Right. And I, I know it's really difficult with children, but you yourself should always be looking inside saying, what can I do? How can I change? Um how can I take more responsibility for the way I'm responding? And in, in doing that, especially with your children, uh, they will follow suit. Right, they will they will slowly and surely pick up from your leadership in that regard. Right, so playing the inside out game is really important because you're choosing as a parent to take responsibility, um, and you're saying, okay, I'm in charge here in a really healthy way. I'm not ordering uh, this this young girl out, but I'm not blaming her, and that is really important. Like it's a massive step. Okay, um, step number three. Once you've realized that you're playing the inside out game and that you have more responsibility here than you were originally hoping you would have, and you're not blaming and judging and villainizing your daughter, you can now start doing the work, right? And what does doing the work mean? Well, for me here at Stripe, it's about living a self led life. The term self uh, comes from 
um, the Psychotherapy Internal Family Systems by Dr. Richard Schwartz, who's been a guest on this podcast. Go check it out. It's really cool. Um, and Dr. Richard Schwartz believes that we, like I said earlier on, we, we're not mono mind. We are a collection of different personalities that he calls parts. Um, but amongst that collection of personalities is self. It's like the most beautiful, perfect essence of who you are, right? Um, there's no badness there with self. There's, uh, there's just goodness, right, if you want. And then you have parts, like parts of your ego. Um, all of these parts are designed to keep you safe, but their methods of doing this are often juvenile um, and destructive, right? Uh, because you, these parts learn to protect you when you were very young, um, and very naive, and they just haven't changed in a very long time. So doing the work is about getting some coaching, doing some therapy, joining communities like Strive, um, and really kind of like doing the head work, the intelligent work of learning and understanding things like trauma, how the nervous system works, attachment styles, um, parenting guides and books, self-help books, all that kind of stuff, the intellectual stuff. Then there's the embodiment. Like, like, so if I want to be a better parent, I can't just read a book. I need to like put some of the things that are in the book into practice. Like, so like you can listen to this podcast intellectually and think, oh yeah, okay. So I need to know when I'm fighting, I need to live the inside out game. But if you don't practice these things, you're not going to embody what it means to be a self-led parent, right? So you have to kind of do that work. Like it's really, really important. Um, and then there's the feeling side of it. There's the getting out of your head, getting into your body and really paying attention to how you feel. Oh my God, I have arms, I have legs, I have a gut, I have a heart, I have a throat. And actually when my daughter screams at me and says she doesn't want to go to bed with me, I feel a tightness in my stomach. So like doing the work is, is about really holistically understanding yourself on every level uh, much more deeply, okay? Um, and dealing dealing with your fallout. So if, for example, <coughs> your daughter says she hates you and she doesn't want to go to bed with you and you respond by screaming at her um, and that is not the way that you want to go about it, there's some work to do there, right? Like why is this four to five-year-old able to dysregulate me? Is there work I need to do around self-regulation? Do I need to understand my nervous system or how can I remain calm in the face of her storm so she feels safe? Like there's some work there, right? And um, and what is it about what she's saying or what she's be how she's behaving that is actually triggering me? Yeah, like did something happen when I was young? Uh, I could tell you, for example, that when I was very, very young, one of four children, my parents didn't spend a lot of time with me. My father never played with me ever. So when my daughter wants to play with me, for example, there's an inner child part of me uh, that gets resentful of her because when it was younger, my dad never played with that, that part of me. And I didn't know that it existed until I had a kid. And I had to be coached. That had to be coached out of me. Like I, I had not coached out of me, but... I, I had to receive coaching um, to understand that part of the trauma, right? So I could be a better father. So it's not about fixing, it's not about my daughter doing the work, it's about me doing the work so I can show up as a really safe um, and accepting human being for my daughter when she is triggered. Because it's so important for you as children to grow up and your parents see the worst of you and to accept that. Right. Like this is like it's almost like we, we, we call this like getting your narcissistic supplies met. So when you're younger, you really need your parents to reflect back to you that you're perfectly imperfect, that like that you're beautiful, that you're golden, that, that, that when you look in the mirror, what you see back is amazing and perfect. Because if you don't have those narcissistic supplies when you're very young, when you're older, you'll seek them outside of yourself. Very often, uh, parents, for example, who don't have those narcissistic supplies. They have a lack of self-esteem. So they try to find that love in their children. Oh, they try to cuddle them and kiss them too much and muddy cuddle them, hoping that they'll get kissed and cuddled back because they have an emptiness within themselves. But when you're a parent and you're able to do the work and try to towards having a growth mindset, a secure attachment style, uh, living a self-led life, 
then your pet, your, then you will be able to be calm and regulated when they're in a mess and to reflect back to them that it is okay, that it, that it is very human um, to have shame. It's very human to be humiliated. It's very human to have embarrassment, jealousy, envy. It's very human to have fear. It's very human to fall apart and scream. And it's okay to say you hate your father because that's the only way you know of telling him that he's overstepping a boundary or you feel unsafe with him, right? Like that needs to be reflected back. And you cannot do that unless you are in a state where you have the skills, where you have the abilities to do it. And we all have them within us. Sometimes we just need a guide or a group or whatever to like get that out of us, to activate uh, that really wonderful parent that's within us all. Number four, it's a tracking system. Uh, the Conscious Leadership Group, check them out. Uh, online book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, one of the best books in the world ever. A lot of my work comes from that, but they have a great website as well, Conscious Leadership Group. Um, and they talk about this line, you know, like a horizontal line. Um, and you're either above the line or you're below the line. When you are above the line, you are in self. You are calm, compassionate, curious, creative. Uh, you have clarity. You have courage. You have compassion. You have access to the ability to play. You have a perseverance and a presence about you, right? Like you're in a state of flow more often when you're above the line. And when you're with your children and you're being a parent, you want to be above the line as often as you can. When you are below the line, this is where you drip into drama, dip, not drip, dip into drama, into chaos, uh, into victim consciousness. You go into something called the drama triangle, where you take on the role of victim, villain, or hero, and you cast your children in an opposing role. So very often, I will treat my daughter Zia as I was certainly doing this uh, before the project, still do it today sometimes, I treat my daughter like she is a villain and I become a victim, right? Playing the outside in game. Or I treat her like a victim and I try to hero her. Good example would be I try to dress her and I feed her all the time because I don't think she's capable. Like I'm being a hero, right? Like I should just let her get on with it and trust that she could do it type of thing, right? So. Below the line, you're in blame, judgment, and you are um, locked in this need to be right. So when you're trying to be a more conscious parent or a living a self-led life as a parent, really understanding where you are on this line is important. Um, and I would really suggest starting out that every two hours you set an alarm on your phone, and when it goes off, you check in with yourself. And you ask yourself, am I above or below the line? <laughs> Now, this is really great, really good work and long-term work because, you know, if you sometimes it will be difficult to ascertain if you're above the line or below the line because your parts, your ego, is so blended with self, you don't really know. So, like, I was in my 40s and, and, I was, and my parts were living my life. The, the, my parts were in this, holding the steering wheel in the car of my life, if you like, use that as a metaphor, for so long that they had blended into self that I didn't even, I didn't have a self. Like I, I, it would be, it's been buried under like thousands and thousands of parts. So it's not easy to identify where you are on that line. And this is where coaching uh, can really help. When I coach people one-to-one -one and we're doing parts work, for example, it, it's always really apparent when you're dealing with a part or when you're dealing with self, but the person who you're coaching has no idea. Like they really think they're in self, but you can you can tell when you're trained as a coach that they're not. So they need help and guidance to point out that blind spot. So number four, the line. Know where you are. Have a barometer to know where you are. Number five, um, choosing context over content. I'm actually going to be running a workshop on this in Strive next week. So if you want to join, just email me at the strive method at gmail.com or send me a WhatsApp on plus four four seven five three seven eight nine six eight two nine and I'll give you more details about that. Okay, let's take a short break. Are you feeling stuck in life? Are you tired of wearing the mask? Is the armor weighing you down? 
At Strive, we understand the struggle of living unconsciously and feeling disconnected from yourself and the world. So imagine breaking free, living more authentically, and building meaningful relationships. If this is what you truly want, if you truly want a life full of purpose, meaning, and connection, then Strive may be the home for you. Our community and methods are designed to help you unlock your potential and to lead a conscious, self-led life. So consider joining the Strive community today. Let yourself be seen, let yourself be heard, and maybe for the first time in your life, feel like you truly matter. Email me at thestrivemethod at gmail.com or send me a WhatsApp message on plus four four seven five three seven eight nine six eight two nine and I'll give you further instructions. Now, back to the action. Context versus content. The first time I heard about context versus content, it was um, it was in one of Melanie Joy's book books, uh, getting relationships. No, it was um, can't remember the book off the top of my head. Sorry, Melanie, uh, but it was a book about helping vegans and non-vegans live together. Basically, so that's the first time I'd heard about context and content, and then later I heard about it on um, in a conscious leadership group. And basically with context and content, if we take every life, every piece of life as a conversation, for example, uh, content is what you talk about and context is how you talk about it. So great leaders, people who choose to live a self-led life, they're amazing at the content. Like they can talk about all kinds of stuff. But where they really excel is choosing context over content. It's like really pushing to the forefront of their work, um, how they show up, what energy they show up in, uh, what principles they apply into their life, beliefs, worldviews, values, and living aligned to them, not just giving them lip service, is really important. Uh, Let me give you an example. So... Let's say me and Zia are in the bedroom and we have a fight and I apologize, but I apologize from below the line, parts activated in my inner child. She is going to pick up on that and she's not going to feel that the apology is sincere. Okay. But if I choose contextually to show up in self-energy when I'm making apologies, she will feel it, right? Right. I can talk uh, to with my wife about budgets and money, but I can choose to talk about budgets and money from a place of fear and a place of blame and judgment and playing the outside in game below the line. Or I can choose to come at that from the context of self-energy above the line and having that conversation uh, from a place of curiosity um, and clarity and compassion. Right. So this is really important because you'll know when you're choosing content over context because you'll just be having more fights and you won't be able to control the situation. You'll feel out of control and dysregulated. When you choose context over content, you are it's easier to be more regulated. Your emotional intelligence will increase and you'll find yourself above the line in self-energy. Your container, your window of tolerance will be so much more vast and able to handle this whirlwind um, of a four-year-old, right? So choosing context over content is really important, number five. Number six, let's have a cup of tea, is always take 100% responsibility for the way you respond to everything. And this is really difficult, especially if you're in parts energy all the time because you'll resist. You might go into rational and logical, well, no, It's not right for me to take 100% responsibility all the time. But actually, as long as you uh, have very strong boundaries and you know the difference between right or wrong and you know when you're in self and you're in past energy, taking 100% responsibility for the way you respond is incredibly powerful and your children pick up on it and follow suit. It's really, really healthy. So... I always use this. Ex- I mean, I use a different example. Uh, yeah, no, I always use this example because it's powerful. And it's very simple. Let's say I'm in the kitchen 
and I've just cleaned up and I think I've done a really good job. And Liza comes into the kitchen and says to me, um, you're a fucking idiot. I can't believe you have left the cutting board out again. I told you so many times to put it away. What's wrong with you? Are you fucking stupid or something? And I turn around and say, don't talk to me like that, you bitch. And then we start having a fight. <laughs> we don't talk to each other like that. But I'm using that as an extreme example. If I went to my friends back in the day and told the story just like that, they probably would agree with me that I was quite within my rights to call her a bitch because she called me a fucking idiot. She started it. Never been in those conversations before? She started it. You started it. Like, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that, right? Below the line, victim consciousness again, yeah? So in that respect, it's very easy for me to fall below the line and be a victim and to make Liza a villain, okay? And then to demand that she apologize for calling me a fucking idiot. Now, what I found that happens when you go into those scenarios is the people that you are talking to generally will not be resourced, will not be able to remain above the line, and they will dip below the line themselves into victim consciousness, and there will be this resistance, and whatever resists persists, and they will defend, and they will judge, and they will try to justify why they were right in the way that they talk to you. For example, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Maybe I shouldn't have called you a fucking idiot, but you let the fucking chopping board out. And I've told you so many times before, and you just get caught in this cyclone of needing to be right and justification, and it's very damaging. And I'm using this example with my wife, but this is like happens all the time with our children. So if you get yourself into a position where your children are consistently trying to be right or say, yeah, dad, or yeah, mom, I know you say this, but you always do that. It's a good sign that maybe we're not leading and taking responsibility here, right? So in this case, I could go to Liza and I could say, hey, Liza, yesterday when you came into the kitchen and I was cleaning and you called me a fucking idiot and said, is there something wrong with me? Am I stupid because I didn't put the cutting board away after you've told me for uh, several times to do it? I turned around and called you a bitch. I imagine that really angered you, right? I imagine it really angered you to like to be called a bitch. And I bet it really angered you as well to see the cutting board out if you really believe you've told me multiple times to put it away. And I really need, I need us to be close. I need us to be connected. We weren't in that moment. Um, and yeah, my request, I guess, is uh, did I get, did I, did I get it right? Like, is there anything else you want to add to to what I've just said? Or is, is everything I've said make sense? Do you know what I mean? Or uh, my only request is that I'm not going to call you a bitch again, and I'd really, really ask if you try not to call me a stupid idiot, right? Whatever it is, right? Um, you lead in that way, and here's the thing. There's uh, usually what can happen is the person who you're – who you're talking to and taking responsibility, they could be like, yeah, yeah, you were an idiot for calling me. Yeah, you could go into that respect. You've got to ex you've got to wait for the sucker punch that comes afterwards and still be dealing with it and taking 100% responsibility. Um, you lead like that. And honestly, people melt, especially your children, right? Like if you're able to say, like Zia going to bedtime, for example, like, I'll say something mean. She'll say, you're so mean. And back in the, uh, uh, you're so mean and you shouted at me and I would say, I didn't shout at you. I wasn't mean. Um, you're the one that's like playing up. These days I'm like, do you know what? That was a really mean thing for me to say. And I was angry. And I imagine it made you feel afraid. And I'm really sorry that I did that. Can you forgive me? You know, like really important. So 100% responsibility, super, super important. Number seven, won't spend a lot of time on this one, but it's so important. Be present with your children. Like, choose quality of time over quantity. Uh, I did a social media post on this the other day. Um, I had a real resentment against my children 
for wanting me to play with them uh, because my dad never played with me. Like I said, my inner child would be triggered as a result of that. But also, I had shit to do, right? Like I worked all day. I come home, especially especially when I was drinking. I wanted a bottle of wine. I wanted to relax. I wanted to talk to my wife. I I just didn't want to play with my kids, um, and that led to disconnection. And then when I was doing this project with the Elementum Coaching Institute, I said to myself, you know, what? I'm going to get up every morning because Zia really struggles to get up for school, and I'm going to play with her for 15 minutes. And then when I take her to bed, I'm going to play with her for 15 minutes before we go to bed. And she loves those 15 minutes. And I love those 15 minutes. And I, my phone isn't on. I have got a laptop in sight. There's just me, her, and the cat and our toys. We, we have this attic called Toy Town. And we just play. Um, and that's enough. 30 minutes. And she absolutely loves it and adores me. So, and, and if I'm not paying attention, like, Recently, we got a new cat and the cat started coming up and she'd be like, dad, you're not paying attention to me because you're messing around with the cat. Like, I'm so sorry, right? Because presence is really important for your kids, right? It's really important. So, and also watch how present you are with your wife or your husband and vice versa, because they'll pick up on that as well. Like if you're talking to your partner or your partner's talking to you and you're fiddling around on your phone or you're in fucking la-la land, um, your child's going to expect that that's a norm and they'll do the same to you. But there's nothing better than absolute pure presence. Get down to their level, eye to eye. Zero says to me, why do you kneel down and get close to me? I'm like, because I want to see you eye to eye. I want to get on a level with you. So that and curiosity. So presence and curiosity. Um, When you're in self, you have access to what Richard Schwartz calls the ACs of self. I said them earlier on. Um, It's like calm, clarity, courage, compassion, connection, creativity, curiosity, and clarity, right? And curiosity is super powerful. So if your daughter is angry, what is it they're, that they're angry about? If, the do- if your daughter is sad, what is it they're sad about? If something's going on at school, what is going on? Like, just ask questions and be curious about what's going on. That really helps. Uh, number eight, rupture and repair. This is, like, huge. For me. Living a self-led life is all about accepting that within us, we have the seeds of greatness uh, to achieve most things in life. The only thing that stops us is ourselves and a little bit of biology. I'm never going to be an NBA basketballer, but I could work in basketball if I wanted to. Um, So like having compassion with yourself. So like I know, for example, I am a fabulous father. I think my two kids, Jude and Zia, have won the absolute lottery. Um, But there are times when Liza's like, I don't agree with that. I think that you've been a terrible father sometimes. And I'm like, okay, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, I get that. That's no problem. I just know that I'm an amazing father who fucks up a lot. I mean, let's be honest. Nobody is going to hurt Zia more nobody's hurt Zia more than I have in this lifetime. I could tell you that for sure. Like I've upset her and harmed her mentally, not physically, more than anybody else on this planet. Yet I still think I'm an incredible father. Um because I believe what is going on is very human. Like I think it's very human when you've gone through life like I have and had the trauma that I've had and and have the parts that I have and the inability to manage my nervous system because nobody ever taught me any of this shit. Of course, when you're a parent, this shit is going to come out and your kids are going to feel the brunt of it. But the most important thing is to be a father, is to be a man who says, um, my stake is in the sand. I want to live a self-led life. And that means I'm going to take 100% responsibility for the way I respond in every situation. And this is where rupture repair becomes really important because the goal at, uh, at Strive is not to get ahead of the curve so you're never, ever doing this shit. I just think that it's impracticable. I think I'll be upsetting people on the day that I die, right? Like, And I'm hoping to be a centurion. And I'll still be fucking pissing Liza off. I'll still be pissing my kids off. I'll still be pissing the cat off. I'll still be pissing the gas man off because I'm human, right? So 
So for me, it becomes less about getting ahead of the curve, although that will happen naturally, and more about getting your shit together once you fucked up. Like, you need to accept. Everybody says failure is great. Failure means that I learn when I make a mistake. Everybody says that and plays lip service to it, but do you really truly believe it? That's like the really core cool thing, you know? So when I go into the room and I upset my daughter and I'm not resourced and my window of tolerance and my capacity to hold her in all of her parts, it's just not there in that moment and I upset her drastically. I need to recognize that. I need to go away. I need to separate myself from her. I need to get my shit together. I need to regulate myself. And when she's regulated and I'm regulated, I can go in and I can say, hey, can I put something right? Because I'm not happy the way I dealt with you yesterday. Yes, you can, dad. Boom. I then repair that rupture. And what I'm doing is I'm teaching my daughter that it is perfectly okay for her as a human being to fuck up, for her past to be activated, for her to say mean things to the people she loves the most. It is okay to do that as long as she then gets back into integrity and repairs that rupture. How to repair the rupture? She needs to learn how to communicate effectively, right? So like I use nonviolent communication by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. I try to teach Zia that. That's how I communicate with her. Sometimes she laughs at me when I go into my observation, uh, feelings, needs, and requests, but I think it's really powerful. Uh, and you're teaching her that it's okay to be infallible as long as you clear up your shit and fix it afterwards. So rupture repair, really important. And lastly, nine, the piece that knits all this together is integrity, right? And this is what it's all about. And again, my worldview on integrity comes from the Conscious Leadership Group. Um, and the four pillars of integrity, number one, you take 100% responsibility for everything and the way that you respond to people we talked about earlier on. Number two, you are authentic. You are authentic. You you do what you say you're going to do. Um, you understand and discern between parts and self, right? You don't gossip behind people's backs. You don't say one thing to their face and one thing in your mind, right? Like similarly with feelings, right? Like you, like you express how you feel, but you do it in a healthy way. So being authentic is really important. And this can really startle and scare and put a lot of people off. Um, I'll tell you, one of my biggest problems since I've become alcohol-free as fuck and started to live a self-led life, actually, is finding that a lot of people are not authentic and they're actually scared of, of authenticity. Um, I don't like it when I can't talk about certain things. I'll tell you the number one thing that people don't like to talk about and there's such a problem with it and it gets on my nerves is money. It's not sex. Like if I talk about my financial situation or what's going on in my life or, or I talk about money, like it's such a taboo subject. People don't like it. And yeah, there's boundaries around that and all that kind of thing for me to learn. But for me, it's really important to be, and this goes back to being okay with myself as a human, perfectly imperfect, right? Loving uh, the wabi sabiness of myself, to pinch a Japanese phrase, right? So being authentic. Um, feet, number three, the third pillar of integrity is feeling your feelings through to completion. This was huge when I did my master life coaching. And one of the things that I'm teaching Zia to do, and that is um, if you feel angry, get it out. If you feel sad, get it out. If you feel shame, Feel it. If you're embarrassed, feel it. If you feel joyful, feel joyful. Like, don't suppress and repress your emotions because if you do, um, it's like whack-a-mole. Eventually, it's just going to pop up and and you're not going to be able to keep hammering it down and it's going to show and it's going to be a mess. Um, I don't do it now, but when I was in California going through my training, whenever I would feel angry, I would go outside in the garden. I would take my shoes and socks off, go into the mud, and I would scream my anger out and uh, fortify my boundary with it so I wouldn't spew it on Liza and Zia. Very regularly in this house, you'll hear Liza in the shower screaming her head off. You'll hear me in here screaming, Zia screaming. People next door might feel we're mad, but we're, get, we're, we're getting our energy out so we don't put it 
um, on each other in a unhealthy way. So feeling your feelings through the completion is really important. And we're not trained to do this. Kids are trained to shut up. Don't be too excited. Don't be too over exuberant. Don't cry. Um, don't be angry. Don't shout. Don't say you hate me. Like, don't, 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 don't. So, of course, everybody in society grows up suppressed and repressed. So, you know, when your daughter wants to scream and wants to shout, let them do it. You just got to find a way for them to do it in a healthy way. All right. And then number four, you've got to have solid agreements. You've got to know how to put an agreement in place. You've got to know how to change an agreement and you've got to know how to deal with agreements that you break with yourself and with other people. They're the four pillars of integrity. And the Conscious Leadership Group says that integrity is all about energy management. It's about, it's about the flow of energy. Like when you are in self-energy, you're flowing, man. Like there's no blocks like when you're in parts energy, there's blocks. You can feel it in your gut, in your throat, in your chest, in your arms, in your legs. Like you feel tightness, you feel constriction. Like emotions that are kept inside and repressed and, and suppressed, they, they create blocks. Carla McLaren always talks about sadness. Let it flow. Release it. Don't let it block, right? So according to the Conscious Leadership Group, and it really sings to me, is if your energy is not flowing in the right way, then it's, you're out of integrity, right? Like you want to get into integrity. We have a really great integrity workshop at Strive. So if you want to join our Strive family, like I said before, email me at the strive method at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on plus four four seven five three seven eight nine six eight two nine. As that's all I got for you. Those are the nine things that have helped me develop a stronger connection with my daughter. And right now I can tell you that we're closer than ever. She loves her dad. Um, she still has her moments, particularly around bedtime, where she still wants her mum to go to bed. She still, she said last night, actually, funny enough, I hate you. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. You need to offload some steam. And I don't take it personally. I know that she just wants to stay sleep with her mum because her mum um, is just a overall... Great person to sleep next to. No problem, right? So we have a great relationship. And um, like I say, I'm really lucky and she's really lucky. And I have a 23-year-old son who I'm also trying a lot of these things with as well. Raised him very, very differently. Um, he's a young man now, so obviously it's very different. But I'm still leading by example, I guess, by doing the work myself. If you are children, and don't forget, all these things I'm talking about, about dealing with external children, you're doing all this internally. You're taking 100% responsibility for how you deal with your inner children inside. You're raising awareness of the fighting and the conflict that you're having internally. You're understanding if you're playing the inside out or the outside in game with your parts. Trauma, internal. Attachment styles, internal. Nervous system, internal. Are you above or below the line with yourself? Are you present with yourself? Are you curious about what's going on with yourself? Are you repairing ruptures with yourself? And are you aligned with integrity with yourself? Are you taking 100% responsibility for the way you're responding to yourself? Are you authentic to yourself? Are you feeling your feelings through the completion? And are you sticking with your own personal agreement? So don't have to be a parent of children outside because you're parent of children inside, right? So hope that helps. Um, please go to uh, www.thestrivemethod.com and you'll find a free guide there. It's called, um, <laughs> I can't even remember what it's called. It's called, uh, let me see what it's called. Give me a second. Why can't I remember my own book? Da, 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 da. Nurturing Resilience, How to Raise Children in the Digital Age. There you go. That's what it's called. Um, the reason I read, wrote this guide is I was watching a um, Instagram post with Gary Vaynerchuk and a woman in her 30s or 40s. She was at a conference with him and she whispered in his ear, how can I prepare my daughter for social media? 
And Gary Vaynerchuk whispered to her, in that, something like a paraphrasing, you're never going to prevent her from going on social media. What's important is you raise her in a way that she has high self-esteem. And then if she has high self-esteem, social media is not going to be a problem for her because um, she'll be able to manage it healthily. And what I took out of that was, if you're a parent and you're worried about your kid growing up in today's digital age with TikTok and uh, Instagram and Facebook and uh, Snapchat and all these different things and AI, you know, it's like a minefield, right? And we know that suicide and depression in our youngsters is on the rise, right? If you're worried about all that, we don't want to be playing the outside in game. We don't want to be trying to change our children. We don't want to be trying to stop them from using social media uh, because at some point you're not going to be able to do that. What you need to do is work on yourself. If you can do the work, you as a human being, to get more aligned and secure in your attachment style, if you can lean more towards a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset, if you can raise your line awareness so you're in self-energy more than you're in parts, do all the things that we just spoke about today, then wow, your children are going to grow up uh, to be much more rounded, much more grounded, much more healthy human beings. And they'll be playing the inside out game. So they will not be at the whim of social media. They will not need the approval of social media or people on social media to make them feel safe because their safety is secured and, and sourced from within themselves. So that's why I wrote this guide. So please check it out um, and please share it with people. It's over at www.thestrivemethod.com. Um, you'll love it, I'm sure. And if you have any questions on the guide or anything we spoke about today, like I said, email me at the strive method at gmail.com or WhatsApp me on plus four four seven five three seven eight nine six eight two nine. Okay. Uh, lastly, um, please rate and review this show because it will attract more people and tell at least one person today about it. I know in the past, a lot of people said, I don't want to do that because I'm too embarrassed about being alcohol free as fuck. But we didn't talk about that today, did we? We talked about parenting. So if you know someone out there who's a parent who could do with learning some of this stuff, send it out to them. Okay. Much love, everybody. Take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a few thank yous. First of all, I want to thank uh, you guys and girls for listening to this podcast and being supporters of it. Many people stop drinking alcohol just by listening to this podcast. I got a lot of people reaching out to me, thanking me for that, right? So give this to somebody as a gift today or rate and review the podcast. If you can rate and review the podcast on your local podcast player and tell somebody about it, you could change somebody's life today, okay? So thank you for listening and thank you in advice in advance for that piece of service. Also want to thank our producer, Stan. Um, Stan is still currently in the Ukraine fighting the war and producing our podcast while his family is somewhere else in the world right now, okay, apart from him. So everybody send out your prayers and your love. Stan, we love you. Thank you very much for everything you do here. For you out there, if you are starting to think about, contemplate, uh, reflect on your relationship with alcohol. You do not have to do this alone. Yes, you drink alone, but you don't have to stop alone, okay? And if alcohol is not your thing, but you are starting to feel that you actually are living a parts-led life, the ego is getting in the way too much, so you're not happy with the way life is going, then reach out to us at the strive method at gmail.com. Just say, Lee, and just tell me what is on your mind, and we'll start to have that conversation. Strive Community is a beautiful place where you can start to feel seen, heard, and matter. It's where you can get community, and it's where you can start practicing what we call the eight C's of self, our core values, right? Or creativity, curiosity, uh, connection, compassion, courage. Uh, I can't remember the rest of them, but there's eight of them, right? And we have our quest structure. So we have assignments, and they're really interesting, exciting. At the end of them, we say to you, come on. Do this quest, right? Get involved in this challenge. Um, and strivers are really finding it exciting. And they're working their challenges in these areas that are going to increase the amount of time they spend in self-energy in a state of flow. And that is has amazing repercussions for the relationship you grow with yourself and for how you 
how you reach out to others in their life, like how you parent, how you um, are as a child to your, not child, but a son or a daughter, how you are in your relationship with the person you share your bed with and how you behave with your employees, right? So reach out to me at strivemethod at gmail.com if you want to learn more. Okay, much love, everybody.